So we want to welcome on behalf of the Collingswood Book Festival today, author Paul Lasicki, who grew up in Cherry Hill and teaches at Rutgers Camden in the English department and has his latest book out later, My Life at the Edge of the World. Hi, Paul. Hi, Tammy. Nice to see you today. We're excited to have you as part of the festival. Yeah, nice to see you too. And hi to everyone out there who's tuning in. Now, Paul, we spoke after your book had come out when you had some readings lined up. And as you know, our conversation was one of the last before we both went into lockdown because of COVID. Your book later is set in a, the previous pandemic, still ongoing, of course, of the AIDS crisis. What has this chapter of your life been like with that as a backdrop or a perspective? Oh, that's such a good question. It's, it's really hard to articulate what this particular moment is because it's morphed so many times since March when we first went into lockdown. I mean, March already feels like years ago to me. I think, you know, where I live in, in Brooklyn right now, it feels like people have found a way to, to live with or against the pandemic in their, you know, in, in our midst. So, um, there's a little less of the, the terror that I think everyone felt um, when you know, the atmosphere, the air was full of sirens all the time and people were scrubbing down their groceries and literally not leaving their apartments. Yes, um, you described later to me previously as learning to live in a day-to-day -day emergency. So this feels a little bit like that. Yeah, definitely. It's like the quality of this particular emergency feels different from that emergency. But yeah, I was interested in writing about survival and how people stay alert and awake when you know, the next day can't be taken for granted. Um, life in Provincetown during the early 90s was super intensified by the, by the presence of, of death everywhere. It was not something that one could ignore or suppress. It was, it, it, it shook everyone up and um, we somehow managed to manage to live um, fully against all that. Provincetown, I know, holds such a special place in your life and in your heart. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how Provincetown is almost a character in later? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I love Provincetown for the fact that, particularly in the early 90s, it was a place that, um, was incredibly welcoming. It was a place that was not fixed in its population. People came and went from all, from all over the country and that kept that place feeling vital and active. And at the same time, that place um, at the tip of Cape Cod is surrounded by national seashore, a lot of which feels really uncharted chartered and um so there's a there's a there's an energizing collision between a town that feels almost urban in its density and say you walk a half mile away and you're in the deepest woods and um the deep you know the highest the highest, most beautiful dunes on the East Coast. You can hear sometimes whales groaning in the ocean into town. At the beginning of later, you're finding your, your way to Provincetown and then trying to find your place within your new home, especially that sense of community. And that wasn't a straight road necessarily as you made your home there we're all sharing a sense of isolation now, whether we're in a community or not. Is there anything you can draw upon from that past experience as you have to deal with sort of the enforced isolation and disconnect that we're all struggling with now? I knew upon my arrival to Provincetown that I had to learn how to read the rules. It felt like I had to make 
make it up every day. And I, I and anyone who moved to that place had to be hyper vigilant. And there wasn't a map handed to us. There wasn't a list of of social codes or mores to follow. It's, I mean, I think that had a lot to do with um, with why it was so interesting and attractive to me because it's, it seemed and felt like no other place I'd ever lived in. And I, you know, it's, we don't have any rules for living in this particular time. And I suspect that, you know, the pandemic in December is going to feel a lot different from the pandemic in September. And we're going to have to find different ways of coping and staying awake and alive and staying in touch with, um, you know, with, with the people who've mattered to us. You know, already I can tell that, you know, Zoom, like Zoom cocktails and Zoom meetings with our friends have lost some of their initial allure and novelty. And so like, how do we, how do we continue to reach out to people and how can we get them to reach back to us to keep, you know, our sense of togetherness alive? And later, AIDS is woven through the entire book in the ultra personal and staying safe yourself and losing friends and seeing friends survive it. What it's easy now for people to think that's almost a crisis behind us. What do you most want people to know about AIDS today in 2020? Well, a million people at least died as. as recently in the world, globally, as two years ago. So it's an ongoing crisis in all parts of the world. And um, I think many have believed that it's of no concern to them because it isn't part of their demographic. So I, mean, I think to me that the, the prime difference between that crisis and this crisis is that there is this assumption that we're all, that, that, that we're all vulnerable mm -hmm. to COVID. When in fact, many people had just decided that wasn't their worry during um, the worst of the HIV AIDS years. So um, I think many people are still living with a sense of ongoing trauma after, you know, after all the erasure and um, the erasure and consequence of so many years, the stigma the, you know, the punishment, people losing, you know, people being shunted out of their family homes, all of that. Paul, can you describe, because this is a book festival filled with people that love good writing, can you describe a little bit about later in the sense that you use what you've described as almost prose poems in certain parts of the book? Well, it's a book that wants to keep um, reinventing itself according to form. I think there are parts that move like essays in which there's an emphasis on the speaker's thinking and interpretation. And then there are parts that feel really narrative that, that echo the work of fiction. And then there are parts that feel as concentrated and image-centered as as poems do. So I wanted to, the book to keep changing shape and to, you know, not do that in a way that was distracting or um, confusing to the reader, but to find the right form for, for the material at, at any given moment. So it's, you know, it's, it's a book that, that's in part Super sad, but it's all, there are parts that are that are really really funny. It's it's an animal that keeps that keeps changing. It's never static, and um, that seemed to echo to my mind what life felt like then. Um, yeah, the intensity, the prospect of all of that mortality just amped everybody up. Um, yeah because you never knew whether 
you know, the, the guy you talked to at the supermarket on Tuesday would, would be okay um, a week later. AIDS often took people really immediately. They would, you know, they would be able to control their illness for a long time, you know, suppress it through meds, and then, you know, come down with an opportunistic infection, and then that person would be gone. Paul, can you just talk a bit about, over the course of your career, challenges that you think you went through because you're a gay writer? It's really hard for me to tell what has gone on behind the scenes. I know what it's like to have a book that, say, an agent is excited about, and then to bring it to a group of editors whom he expects to make a lot of money from, and for them to say, you know, this is not the breakthrough book. And I know a lot of that has to do with this idea of sales, which is elusive and mysterious but some seem to have a strong sense of, you know, what that number could be. So, I mean, I th I've just gone on um, trying not to concentrate on any of that. And I know that our conception of these divisions has changed a lot. If you think about the wide audience, the general audience who comes to um, Carmen Maria Machado's work or Garth Greenwell's work, or um, Andrew Sean Greer winning the Pulitzer for less a couple of years back. So um, I think as a writer, I, I have hope that, um, you know, that those, that, that, that distinction is going to matter less. I know, you know, I, I get letters from people. I hear just as often from straight readers and from women as I do from gay men. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so I've always looked to that as, as maybe some kind of validation that I'm, that I'm doing what I, that I'm, I'm, I'm reaching the multiple audiences that I want to reach. Paul, my final question, and I can't let you go without asking this. You are from Cherry Hill. What of South Jersey and the Jersey Shore still exists in your writing as you sit down before the blank page? Um, my love of that landscape, my love of the pines, the pine barrens on the way to the shore. I love the fact that the shore is, like, sits really low. And I love the marshland, that sense of liminal space between mainland and sandbar. I think that's always infused my imagination, the fact that that shore is, is, is not separate from the water, you know? It just, I, I think the sense of mutability of that particular part of the world um, still informs my work. And I know that um, if I'm bored with something, when I'm writing, I, I put some water on the page and that activates everything. I think most of my books, I think all of them, all six of them are set somehow near the ocean. Plenty of them are in New Jersey too. I think more of my work is set in New Jersey than, than say later. So yeah, it's, it's, it's in my psyche. Well, thank you, Paul. I can speak on behalf of South Jersey that we're glad you're back and we're very excited that you're part of the festival this year. Everybody should go out and read later and The Narrow Door. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Tammy. Take care, everybody.